This is vegan style. Vegan style. Hello and welcome to Vegan World Radio on KPFT 90.1 FM. This is your guest host, Bob Rapfogel and Dr. Sophia Panetta Achoa. We will be with you for this evening's show shortly. This is Vegan Style. Good evening, Houston, and welcome to this week's Vegan World Radio on KPFT 90.1 FM. We are very happy to be here hosting the program tonight. And by we, I mean Bob Raffogel, who is here with me and is a local corporate lawyer here in Houston, and also a co-founder of the nonprofit Meet Your Future, and myself, Sofia Pineda Ochoa, I'm a practicing physician here in Houston and also co-founder with Bob of Meet Your Future. Thank you. And by the way, just for those who aren't familiar, Meet Your Future, which is actually spelled M-E-A-T, Meet Your Future, is a uh, free educational resource that uh, Sophia and I recently founded to provide information about the uh, health, environmental, and ethical implications that are involved with animal consumption. We still have a lot of work ahead of us putting everything together that we want to put together, but we've started posting content as we complete it, which can be found on our, our website, which is uh, just meetyourfuture.com, again, M-E-A-T, or through our Facebook page. Uh, tonight, we're really going to focus mainly on uh, environmental issues related to animal agriculture. So, Sophia, do you want to talk a little bit more about what we're going to discuss this evening? Yes, we are. We have a fantastic show tonight. Since it is pouring rain outside here in Houston, we're going to be talking about some water issues involved with livestock production. We'll also be joined later by Lorelei Plotzik the founder of Truth or Drought, a grassroots campaign in California that is helping educate the people about the connection between um, animal agriculture and uh, the droughts and water shortages that we are facing. Yes, and I think it's also you know important to, to, to note that notwithstanding these heavy rains that we have here in Houston lately, uh, it's also important to keep in mind just how scarce fresh water resources uh, really are. Uh, this is something, of course, people in California have unfortunately come to know all too well, uh, along with, uh, unfortunately, an estimated 2.3 billion people around the globe uh, who live in water-stressed areas. Uh, just a, a few quick facts about water. Uh, first, only 2.5% of the water on the planet is even fresh water, and of that, 70% is essentially inaccessible. It's either frozen in glaciers or permanent snow. Uh, water is an absolutely vital commodity, and, and using it efficiently and sustainably is really necessary uh, to be able to support our civilization as our, our population continues to, to grow very quickly past the 7 billion person mark. Yeah, 7 million. Isn't that amazing that just in the early 1800s, the human population was about... Um, was one billion yeah. people actually in the entire planet and now it's been only about 200 years after that mark which took the entire humanity to get to and now 2015 we are more than 7 billion people mm -hmm. and it's expected by 2050 we're gonna have almost 10 billion people 
And by the end of the century, more than 12 billion people. So it took over 150,000 years to make or to accumulate 1 billion humans on the planet. And now we're getting close to 10 billion. And, or and we're going to be getting close to that's what they um, project by 2050. It, it's, a, it's an unbelievable rate of growth. It really is. And, and to feed that many people... Uh, it is going to take some efficiency. It's going to take some smart ways of, of using our resources. And um, and it looks like um, feeding humans through animal products is not a very efficient way of doing so because uh -huh. all of the calories that we invest in animals, all of the efforts that we make to grow grains to grow these feeds for animals once the animals are sacrificed the portion the proportion of calories that we get is is just a fraction of everything that we invested to grow these animals so it would be um at least uh, at least we would have at least 70% more availability of calories of food if we fed these foods directly to humans instead of feeding it through the animals, through animal products. Right. We could we could feed the current world population a plant based diet right right away, right now. And uh meanwhile we have a, an enormous part of the population uh that suffers from, from hunger because of our inefficient use of uh resources to um create food through animals rather than eating the plants uh, eating them directly and you know among all the different things that are so inefficient whether it's the land use um, or the the being able to actually feed the population that we have of course we're talking um, a little bit tonight about about water and it's it's not only that that animal agriculture is so enormously wasteful in in the way it consumes water um, it, it it also is a leading cause of, of pollution of what little water we do have. So not only is using so much water, it's also polluting the, the water that it's not using. So it consumes a large part of it and then pollutes the rest of it. That's right. And, you know, we've seen since the, I guess, 1970s, uh, this move as our population grows, as it continues to uh, demand animal-based foods uh, in order to meet that demand, in order to meet it uh, in, in a way that is you know, at least economically efficient. It's not efficient as far as use of our resources, but economically efficient. You see, you know, the, the rise of factory farms where uh, animals are put in, in smaller and smaller concentrated facilities in larger and larger numbers. And, and these facilities are all over the place. Uh, they account for 95 plus percent of all animal foods from restaurants. And, and when you go to the grocery store, these foods are coming from factory farms. And in addition to the heartbreaking you know, conditions that these animals endure ba based on being in these confined areas um, and these confined operations, the, they produce an enormous amount of, of waste. Uh, the, the, the animals, they, they, they produce this waste and it's stored in, the, the manure is stored in, in these massive tanks uh, that are basically lagoons that hold millions of gallons of manure and urine per factory farm. And we're talking enormous numbers of factory farms throughout the country and the world, and, and they leak and they get into the water and they cause health problems. We're talking <laughs> about 87,000 pounds of solid manure per second. And yeah. this is a number that we got from the latest official report, a report that mm -hmm. Senator Tom... Harkin requested uh, back in the late 90s, but right now I can imagine that num the number has probably increased with the increasing demand, with the increased population and um, the countries, the Asian countries also becoming more westernized mm -hmm. and more deriving more so to animal products instead of plant products, what they had been doing before. Right. So it's um, you, you see more and more um, of, of these uh, uh, pollutants, you know, from salmonella, E. coli, cryptosporidium, um, fecal coliform, uh, other uh, other pollutants yeah. and, and things that get out of the lagoons into the water and then people drink the water that's contaminated. What, what kind of health problems? You're you're a physician. Uh, you can 
talk about this better, much better than I can. What, what kind of health problems do people have as they uh, are, are exposed to some of these things? Well, you know, you'd have to. There's there's so many dimensions and aspects of this that um, it would probably take the entire show to talk <laughs> about. But uh, just briefly, you know, we can get um, first just to just to set the stage um, of of what we're talking about. The United Nations reported in their um, in their grand groundbreaking uh, report they did in 2006, livestock's long shadow. Something that caught my attention from that report was the fact that they said that 6% of the 307 major manure spills in the state of Iowa were done on purpose. Hmm. Okay, and what caught my attention from this was not the fact that they mentioned some manure spills which were done on purpose. The, what called my attention was the fact that they could mention 307 major manure spills in one state. So as you can see, this is something, uh, and, and those are the ones that are reported, okay? Right. Uh, and so with those terms, I must uh, think that they would probably be gigantic. They were probably very important to be reported in that way. Um, we, we have uh, several issues that we get from being exposed to manure not limited to the infections that we get from the microbials that are containing the manure itself. Uh, the manure usually has heavy metals, which mm -hmm. can come back to us in the water. It can have hormones. It can have antibiotics that were fed to the livestock which, as you can imagine, it would create a pretty like dangerous stew if you have a lot of manure with a lot of antibiotics and a lot mm -hmm. of bacteria all together. That creates a perfect recipe for, um, for antibiotic resistance, is what we're brewing. But also, um, something that is perhaps not as well known is when we are exposed to manure in the water, Manure in the water can cause elevation of substances like nitrates, which in our in our body can cause um, problems. From it has been associated with spontaneous abortions, to problems wow. in malformations in the fetus. That's right. Very disturbing things. Um, we call this other syndrome blue baby syndrome, um, that can happen from the ingestion of nitrates in our water. Does it is it have to be high levels of, of nitrates? How does that, um, you know, so the, the the manure gets into the waters and then, you know, the 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 water people are drinking it with the nitrates and then that that has. Um, well, yeah, of course, um, you know, the higher the levels, probably mm -hmm. the more symptomatic. Uh, what happens specifically with the nitrates? is that it transforms a part of our, the component in our red blood cell is called hemoglobin, which transports oxygen. When we are exposed to nitrates, that component can get transformed into something that's called methemoglobin, which makes it more hard to deliver oxygen to our tissues. So, um, you know, the higher, obviously, if you have very high levels of that, uh, you're gonna have you can have things like seizures and problems like that. But if you have low levels, it can be more insidious, more nonspecific, like fatigue or mm. exercise intolerance. Something that you endure for a period of time that you don't even necessarily know is is anything specific. Yeah, yeah. talk about necessary. You know, yeah. isn't this an unnecessary problem, Bob? Well, that's that's the thing. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, we don't have to breed. That the reason we have these problems um, is because of such a large number of animals that have to be bred and have to be fattened up and have to consume water while they're alive until they're slaughtered and processed. And it's completely unnecessary. If if we uh, shift to a plant-based vegan diet, we get our calories directly, and the animals. It's it's not like they. People always ask, well, if the world goes vegan, what happens to all the animals? Well, they're not going to be bred into existence to be put in these confined industrial 
farms to create the waste, to create the pollution, to use the water, which we'll, we'll talk more about um, when Laura Lay joins us uh, as far as the, the, the enormous and unsustainable use of water. That's right. We insist on breeding animals into existence when we know it's not necessary for us, it's mm -hmm. not healthy, and it's terrible for our environment, and it is horrible for the animals. Absolutely. They suffer most of all. There's, there's no doubt. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, that's the thing that it comes down to, I think, when you look at any of the, you know, any of the issues surrounding this, the environmental issues, the ethical issues, the moral issues, and, of course, the, the, the health aspect. You know, the context has to be is, is none of it is necessary. Not only is it not necessary, it's counterproductive. It's not necessary for the environment. It's it's a net negative, even if people argue about the degree to which it's devastating. It's clearly devastating. And why don't we talk a little bit about the effects that, since we were starting to talk about the manure, mm -hmm. why don't we talk a little bit about the effects that manure has on the workers who work with these manure tanks? Absolutely. It doesn't necessarily have to get in the water, right? If you're working around the, these manure pits and in these conditions that are that are just filthy, crowded conditions where all these animals are kept and all their waste goes, it, you, it can affect the it workers directly. It can be directly. dangerous. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, because manures... Uh, are we... Okay. Uh, manure can create a lot of volatile compounds mm -hmm. that can be quite dangerous for the people who are working with it. It can be also quite problematic for the animals who are standing in it. For example, ammonia. Ammonia is a compound that is released by the manure when it's in the storage and when it's being treated. And now, for example, this one, ammonia, is very irritating. And if you were to smell it, you would see that it would irritate your eyes, it would irritate your nose, it would irritate your mucosas. You would probably be coughing. But for the same reason that it is so irritating, usually workers who work in uh, with the manure pits are not exposed to very high levels of it because it's so irritating. So they, they know when they're getting close to it, they have a warning sign and they, they don't linger where it's likely to be dangerous. They animals. don't linger because it's so uncomfortable and so irritating. But there's others. For example, um, hydrogen sulfide is not as irritating and is a lot more dangerous. It's so dangerous that there have been over the past um, over the past year reports of many people who succumb. Look, I'm looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Sixty workers' death between 2001 and 2010. So, hydrogen sulfide is the leading cause of workplace gas inhalation deaths here in the United States, and it is so impressively dangerous. Mm that workers can succumb to it after taking only two or three breaths of it. And now the problem that I said, unlike ammonia, hydrogen sulfide has a putrid smell. However, it's not as strong and as irritating as ammonia. And also the smell, the, the gas can make your nose, can make your senses um how can I explain? Unsensitive to it. High mm. concentrations of the gas. It kind of numbs your senses can, so can you're not, some, you exactly. don't have that early warning. So the, some workers think that they're okay to go into the manure pit because mm. um, because they're not s s smelling that putrid smell, when in reality it's that they're growing more numb to it. Mm. And then they'll go, in, they'll go in the manure pit, and when there's some agitation of the manure, those levels of hydrogen sulfide can soar very rapidly, and then we have problems with the workers. And it can be it can be deadly. It's not right. It's not just uh, yeah. You no, know, like I said, yeah. you know, I read that from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Yeah. yeah, it can be, it can be deadly. We have also another gas um, that's not as deadly as the hydrogen sulfide. But it is also dangerous, which is methane, which is also produced from the storage and treatment of um, of manure. Mm -hmm. And hydro and excuse me, methane can be 
a safety hazard because it can spark if it's in the right proportions with oxygen it can spark a fire and you you hear on the news it seems like all the time you know just uh, uh this facility or that facility catching on fire and you see the, the this horrible scene of just thousands tens of thousands sometimes given the concentrated uh, you know, crammed facilities with all these animals in them. They catch on fire and they, they, catch they burn on fire. to death. It's so sad. And, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if that contributes to it. But I don't if know. You have that I don't know. I, like, it's a good hypothesis yeah. and it's something. But isn't it sad that these animals, you don't know if they had it even worse or better by dying, uh, yeah. calcified in a, in a fire? Because what was waiting for them anyways could have been worse. was such a nightmare anyways. Yeah, it's, it's it's shades of terrible. I mean, there's no happy ending. It's uh, it, it's, yeah, it's hard. It's it's pretty bad when burning to death might be better than what was actually shades planned for. Shades of terrible. You. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like that, but not, not that I like it, but I like how you're expressing it. Um, why don't we talk a little bit? We still have a little bit of time until we connect with Lorelai. Yes. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about what are some of the like the standard practices that these animals. If they're endured, yeah. If they um, if they make it through everything else, and, if they make it through and, everything uh, don't, else, and don't don't uh, die in a fire or these other horrible conditions. You know, because I had a friend recently who told me, "Oh, but I buy organic. I buy organic, so it's fine." I never fine. understood I, people it's, it's, and they, smart people too. Sometimes have that, and I, I mean, there's, I don't even at a high level see. What does organic have to do with how they're treated? Well, in their minds, often it has to do with organic means happy. Organic yeah, means a happy cow. Oh, I buy organic milk. That means it was a healthy, mm -hmm. a happy cow. Yeah, it must be happy because it was in the field and it was this, you know, this uh, ideal scene that you have in your in your head about just, you know, a happy cow in the field or a happy chicken free range. And you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not really as advertised well, most of the let, time. Let me tell you something. I mean, what does organic... Organic means, like, if you say organic chemistry, mm -hmm. organic means that it had carbon. But I yeah. guess organic means in the terms <laughs> that they use it, you know, that's right. right. Organic chemistry. It, scientifically, yeah. You, you know? Um, but they mean no, sometimes no antibiotics, but sometimes it doesn't... Not only does it not necessarily relate to treatment at all, there's, there's just no connection there, sometimes it, it actually means worse treatment you could you could have in, you could still have these horrible crowded conditions but it's quote unquote organic because there's no antibiotics and in these crowded conditions the animals get sick and they you know can't be given antibiotics to to help them through what it is that they became sick from in these crowded conditions and so sometimes you have i've i've heard uh, i haven't looked into this in detail but you know organic can sometimes mean in in some instances worse treatment but at at, at a minimum it just has no bearing at all. But you know something that calls my attention when they talk, for example, about organic milk. Okay. <laughs> okay. If that means in, by their standards, no hormones added, that doesn't mean that it doesn't include any hormones that naturally came mm -hmm. from the cow. Yeah, there's a pregnant female cow. And I, I'm sure she has hormones. Exactly. Well, now that these these animals are bred such that they lactate mm -hmm. through the pregnancy, and uh, and they are constantly, you know, kept impregnated so that uh, they can be continuously delivering milk. They can mm -hmm. be, you know, milked. Um, the hormone levels that they have just naturally are very important. And it is very relevant. It is relevant when we think about our exposures to things that stimulates, for example, from a health perspective, that stimulates perhaps a uh, hormone-related cancer, mm -hmm. like breast cancer, prostate cancer, any cancer that's related to hormones that can be stimulated and that can cause cell proliferation from hormones. It's relevant even if we think about um, puberty, hmm. precocious puberty, and anything. You know, hormones act in a lot of different places in our body, and they can be very problematic. So Certainly. I would feel very uncomfortable um, drinking a substance that has all of the hormones that the cow produced naturally. That means if they didn't add any additional so, hormones to keep the cow 
um, milking like they frequently do, so unfortunately. Organic. Yeah, so organic with, with respect to milk, with respect to a lot of things, with respect to milk in particular, uh, what you're saying is it, it doesn't it doesn't mean it's free of hormones that are bad for human health. It, it's it's was it uh, Dr. Clapper's term, baby calf growth fluid. I mean, that's what it's designed to do, and you consume it with yeah. everything that it has in it, including the hormones of the mother cow that's who's what pregnant. I'm saying. Every species produces milk specifically for their own calves. Mm -hmm. They want to grow them as quickly, as efficiently as possible. And they are all different from ours. They have different amounts of protein, different amounts of carbohydrates, different amounts of fat, different amounts of vitamins. Uh, we have no business consuming these substances that are completely foreign to humans. And the, and the toll that it takes on the animals, I mean, we've kind of touched on it, and the, we could go on for hours talking about um, you know what the what these animals endure, but but dairy in particular, dairy and eggs. I think people always have this thought in their mind that if you're vegetarian, you're not directly eating the flesh of a dead animal. But you're not you're, eating the flesh, so it's all okay. It's all right. You know, we mm -hmm. could we don't have to kill or hurt the animals. But just talking about you know for practical dairy, purposes, yeah, yeah, for practical purposes. It, for practical purposes, there's no distinction. The, the animals all meet an untimely death. They're abused horribly. Uh, for, for their, their, their short lives with dairy cows, like you said, they don't, there's this idea that I think a lot of people have that they're bred to produce milk. So they just do it automatically. And that's not the case. Like every mammal, they need to be impregnated. They need to have a calf, right? Or they're not going to produce milk. So they're impregnated over and over and over again. And Bob, why don't you tell us what happens with the byproduct of the dairy industry, which are the calves? The calves, because right? Because you know, once they have the calves, the calves are not going to be drinking the milk. They're going to be milking them for our consumption. So what happens to the calves? They're, they are taken away from their mothers almost immediately <laughs> <laughs> so that we can have the milk that is bad for us instead. But what? And, and uh, the byproducts, I mean, any uh, there's going to be a certain number of female calves that they're going to use as the next generation to exploit for their milk. But all of the other calves, including 100% of the male calves who will never produce milk, and any of the excess female calves, surplus female calves that aren't needed for the next generation, are killed either right away within a matter or of for weeks veal. for yes. veal. Or for veal. Usually confined in a, in a crate, yeah. de deprived of iron, and like, they're eating a baby if you're eating veal. But people like veal because it's supposed to be tender, and mm -hmm. it's like a... It's supposed to be like a color that's not as dark. And so to get that, they have them confined in these little cages where they, they on can't purpose, move, they can't exercise. So they don't develop their muscles, so they keep being tender. And then with a diet low in iron so that their flesh is still it's like pink, pink or something. Yeah, yeah. isn't that horrific? It, it, it's, it's horrible. It's a and when we show. have such delicious vegan options absolutely every Let's tell them what we'd like to drink what we like to drink yeah besides beer no i'm <laughs> talking about vegan. milk substitutes yeah <laughs> beer is fine we, we'll, we'll talk a bit i'm sure when we get laura lay about almond milk because almonds have been uh unfairly targeted for their their water consumption but, but there's so many choices we've been drinking rice milk lately what milk do you like to drink i prefer almond milk rice milk uh coconut milk um Soy milk. They, soy I really milk? haven't had any. What about uh, for ice creams? Because people are like, no, but ice cream. Oh, I can never give I up my ice to, cream. I could never give up my there ice cream. There are so many ice creams, non-dairy ice creams that are indistinguishable. You have, was it so delicious? You have um, uh, almond dream. I can't even think of all of them. But there, there's even you know you can well, go I to them in all sorts of flavors and colors. And even if you go to the regular supermarkets, not Whole Foods, you can go to Walmart. You know, yeah, Walmart has. You can them. go to Walmart. You can go to Kroger. You can go anywhere. Yeah, and they they're indistinguishable. They don't have all the problems associated with it, and they don't have the uh, the the you know the animal use behind it that's so horrific. And, so uh, we have a win-win situation. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy and it's convenient. <laughs> no hormones. No pus. No blood. No animal abuse. No suffering. No veal byproduct. And a delicious and uh, tastes... drink. Many of them more calcium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more calcium and um, uh, more vitamins of, of other sorts that they, they have as well. 
That's right. And so I think that now we're going to be going into a little break. And then when we come back, we will listen to... Laura Lee from Truth or Drought out in California to talk more about water issues, the drought, and the connection to animal agriculture. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And I respect for life Run, here come the butcher man When he come in with his knife I'm working, I'm more dead I fear murder Life didn't take for them steak and hamburger They read the plant some seed in the mud Then to take you some fresh in the world's of blood Carnivore, stop fighting it, stop fighting it Hey, give it a life and try You just I'm might get some enlightenment And this the one for the wall of my vegetarians Raw food is in vegans and all the vegetarians Yo, cause I and I not put on it You know we simple Humbleness, we have to live life simple To put some food up on the plate I mean I need no hook, mean I need no bait I unite the roots, me food, me not be shoot Or give me vegetable and some fruit Make us a no bones, no blood, you know we kitchen We not gonna mix up in a vampire living No bones, no blood, you know we kitchen Stop from look up in them health book page Vegetarian will always live Cause everything we eat it always positive And everything you drink it never yet negative You are what you eat, that's why you walk like pig You are what you eat, that's why you walk like pig You treat your body wrong, you own a grave, you are dead Yo, don't panic, cause I'm organic Pure soy soup in my kitchen, yes, I got it Yo, don't panic, cause I'm organic Lentil peas in my soup, I got it All right, we are back now, and now we're going to be talking with Lorelei Plotslick. She is from the grassroots organization in San Diego, Truth or Drought. Uh, Bob, can you present her talk? Um, yeah, a grassroots campaign in California that's uh, helping people make the connection, uh, the undeniable connection, between animal-based diets and freshwater depletion. We had the, the pleasure of meeting Laura Lee in Los Angeles last March. At the World Vegan at Summit. At the World Vegan Summit. She gave a fantastic talk. She did. And she's on the, she's on the line now. Laura Lee, are you there? Hi, this is Lorelai. How are you guys? Hi, Lorelai. Thank you so much for being online. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. So, um, we uh, we know that there's been a lot going on out in California. Do you wanna? Why don't Lorelai? Why don't you tell us first a little bit about what Truth or Drought is and what is it that you guys are doing? Okay. Um, so basically, we formed last fall. Um, just a bunch of, basically a bunch of uh, vegans from the San Diego meetup group that were concerned about this water issue, noticing that nobody was talking about the fact that most of the water actually goes to animal agriculture. Um, you know, the drought in California, not only in California, but in, in many parts of the U.S., the last I heard it was a quarter of the entire country is in drought. Um, wow. And Such so, a yeah, precious we just, commodity. You know, we getting all these like water saving tips about showers and lawns and it was kind of like, wait really no one's gonna no one's gonna talk about where the water is really going and this is not you know an opinion it's it's all factually backed up it's pacific institute shows that 47 percent of california's water footprint is associated with meat and dairy so we just formed this group to get people talking about it 
You know, you talk about the recommendations that you guys were getting from your governor, and I was reading the article that you recently wrote about um, your governor, Jerry Brown, and how he recently commented on how people should be eating veggie burgers. And first, yeah. Lorley, why don't you tell us what's your reaction to that? It seems like it's the dream come true for truth or drought <laughs> to get the yeah. governor of California talking about that. Right. I mean, <laughs> it was shocking. I could not believe it. Um, to me, it it seems like it must have been a calculated thing because I can't imagine that the governor of California would just kind of drop that, like, without thinking about it. Um, Why? I would like to think Why not? That, if it's such an important thing. I know, but all of his, I imagine that his political, you know, connections and financial responsibilities to the ranching industry, I imagine, is huge. Um Yeah, and also mm -hmm. the fact that nobody, it's not a popular topic. You know, people don't want to hear that they have to cut down, you know, never mind, eliminate these meat products. Um, so I think it took a lot for him to say that. I think he probably doesn't want to go down in history as the governor who let the meat and dairy industry drain California dry because that's what they're doing right now. So, yeah, I made a, I made a, a, a meme about it for Truth or Drought with the help of my graphic designer and It's been shared over 3,000 times now. It's been our most wow. popular meme. Yeah. Oh, that's so fantastic. Cool. Yeah, when they see that the governor's saying that, it's like, wait, wait a minute. You know, this isn't just speaking propaganda. It's, <laughs> it's a politician. So that's a big deal. Okay, so this is not PETA saying it. Nothing against <laughs> PETA. It's actually your governor. And so he made right. that comment about veggie burgers. And, Lorelei, why don't you tell us what's the difference If I want to eat a beef burger, why should I eat a veggie burger instead? Of course, I'm vegan. I'm never going to eat a beef burger. But um, <laughs> this is, hey. and just so you know, Lorelei, you're on KPFT, and we have a lot of non-vegan listeners. So why don't you tell all of our listeners what the difference is or what the water footprint is when you use, when you eat a simple beef burger? Okay, so according to the um, a University of Twente report that was co-authored by the, the Water Footprint Network founder, Dr. Hookstra, and he's pretty much the global authority on um, water footprints. Okay. His, his research shows that a, a, third, a beef burger, a typical beef burger, is 621 gallons of water to produce. Some of his other reports show 660. It's a very slight difference. And the veggie burger um, is only 42 So that's over 500 gallons of water difference. Wow. wow. In one simple choice. So it's over 600 gallons of water to produce one beef uh, patty, one beef yep. burger. Wow, yep. that's very impressive. And it kind of uh, is similar to the numbers that we had seen. Uh, we looked at some numbers from the National Geographic website. And I'm just going to read them out um, just very briefly. So according to the National Geographic website, one pound of beef requires 1,799 gallons of water. One pound of beef. One pound of chicken requires 468 gallons of water. One gallon. And, you know, people can say, well, it's, uh, you know, less than half than that of beef, but it is still 400 <laughs> gallons of mm -hmm. water. One gallon, I mean, one pound of pork According to this website, 576 gallons of water. And one gallon of milk mm -hmm. requires 880 gallons of water. And so, Lorelei, we were looking at this fantastic piece that you wrote where you compiled a lot of information when you were talking about Jerry Brown and his statement about eating veggie burgers. Mm -hmm. And you have... A quote here, or you mention um, a very important assertion that the Stockholm International Water Institute said recently. And can you tell us a little bit about that, please, Lorelei? So this was at the 2012 um, World Water Week, actually. So it was a few years ago now. Um, okay. This group, the Stockholm International Water Institute, and these are, you know, leading international water scientists. They found that globally our diets must be minimally 95% plant-based, meaning vegan, by 2050 to avoid 
catastrophic crop shortages because what's happening now is that two-thirds of all agricultural land is being used to grow livestock feed. Um, obviously, just by the nature of giving animals feed, I mean, the, the, the feed conversion ratio, the, the uh, FCR, in itself dictates that there's a, there's a major loss in calories and protein. Um, of course, all the fiber goes away, and cholesterol and saturated fat is actually added. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, animals actually it couldn't be a worse efficient uh, machine when it comes to converting feed into food. Okay, so that's very problematic, and that's very problematic, especially in light, and I think they talked about this with the Stockholm International Water Institute, especially because we anticipate a growth in our population. That's what we're anticipating. I think they anticipate at least 2 billion more by 2050, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So it's not extremely, so that becomes even more pertinent and compelling. Okay, so thank you. And then... Oh, and I uh-huh, should add that the, that group actually, they, I tweeted, I made a graphic out of that stat, and the, the Stockholm International Water Institute actually favorited it on Twitter. So I know I didn't misinterpret their information because they actually <laughs> liked it. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. No, your stuff is going viral. Yeah, it's exciting. It is exciting. It's shocking, it's shocking information, and it's all. I always make sure to put all sources. And these, again, this isn't PETA. This is UNESCO, Oxfam, Dart, a Dartmouth physicist. And nothing uh, against PETA, of course. <laughs> no, nothing against PETA. But people just, you know, they don't, they don't take it seriously. I'm sure their stuff is sourced too. Uh-huh. But I like mm-hmm. to be really careful and make sure that the sources are just mainstream credible, completely reputable sources so that people understand this is real. <laughs> it's not vegan propaganda. Yeah, this is the Stockholm International Water Institute. Yeah, mm-hmm. because you know what, Lorelei, these things need to bubble up to the surface. I, uh, I hope that they, that they will. And they are not bubbling up to the surface. Yeah, it's kind of painful that we have to get into droughts and that we have to see mm-hmm. some of the actual environment, um, environmental impact from the livestock consumption to get this to be more uh, mainstream, but I think it's 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 going there, and I I think it's uh you know we're we're progressing a lot in that regard. And then yeah, uh, it's almost like a silver lining of of the drought because you know maybe this will be what it takes for people to realize that the our current consumption of meat products is, is in no way sustainable. Absolutely, it's in no way sustainable. It is incredibly unhealthy. Yes. And it is a horror for the animals who are involved. Oh, my God. I, I listened to your speech that you did at Rowdy Girl um, on my way home from work. I just I played that video and just listened to it, and I was in tears. I mean, it was just everyone should hear that because it's really hard to hear, but, I mean, you need to hear it. If you're, if you're going to eat animals, you have to know what, what's going into that for that to happen. And if we need to shield our eyes, you know, why shouldn't we shield our stomach? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And um, Lorelei, you know, you, you made a comment here. I'm looking back at your article. And when you said rejecting factory farming but still eating meat products is not scalable. And I think you're absolutely right on that because I think a lot of people who are not, uh, you know, because like we said, this information is not completely bubbling up to the surface as it should. And there's a lot of really nice people, really compassionate people who think, well, I'm getting this, you know, this grass fed, you know, so so this is a okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you think about that, about the scale level? Can you expand a little bit on that? Yeah, um, you know, a lot of my friends, uh, they feel the same way. And, you know, I love them to death. They're great people. But there is a disconnect there. And it's um, if they really thought about it, all of these animals that are crammed into feedlots and warehouses by, by the billions right now, there is no way that those animals can be pastured on land. Um, the, the math, the way it works out, according to uh, a New York Times writer, James McWilliams, um, he found that if each each cow, we're just talking about the cows, not even all the pigs and chickens and turkeys and all the other animals, but just the cows, if they were grass-fed, they would cover half of the, the United States. Wow. So it's not scalable. So if you're demanding, if you're if you're eating meat, if you're still eating meat and you're eating grass-fed meat, you're creating demand for beef 
And the only way that the beef can be produced for everyone is to have factory farms. So that's why I say if you're against factory farming, if you want to walk the talk and not just talk the talk, you really have to ditch the animal products because you are supporting, you're creating demand and supply when you keep eating them. That's right. You know, everybody talks about just beef, but the other livestock operations are just as damaging. Yeah. And if it's not the specific water footprint, they also are very, very harmful for the environment, um, including, I don't know, with the truth or drought, do you guys talk about or get into um, like the overfishing and the fishing situation, or is that something that you guys don't focus on too much? Um, you know, we haven't focused on it a whole lot yet, but it's definitely something that we're going to um, do some graphics on because actually I was looking at the USGS um, website showing where all the water goes in California, and it showed that more water goes to aquaculture than households. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, yeah. the reason you can, and again, it's like people will say, well, I only have wild caught fish. Well, the reason why aquaculture exists is because of demand and supply. So if you're demanding fish, you're creating demand for aquaculture. And it's incredibly mm -hmm. damaging, and it uses tons of water. I did not know that. I, I did not know that about fish. Too. I I know that you know, there's been some reports. Um, some Canadian biologists recently published an, a paper saying that by 2048, if our fishing practices continue to be just like they are, they calculate that by 2048, um, the fisheries are going to be pretty much exhausted or pretty close to exhausted, which means no fish. And when you bring that up, people say, well, then we'll just harvest fish. But What are you going to feed the fish that you're harvesting? But you need yeah. to... Uh, I mean, it's... Uh, um, I know. It, it, it's, you're killing the oceans. I mean, there's going to be widespread uh, impact for, for oh, doing yeah. that. Yeah. Exactly. And then when you... The oceans, uh, without, if we don't have the oceans, we, we don't exist. I mean, you know, they provide functions that, that we need. So, that we yeah, probably I mean, don't even when understand. I see my friends eating eating fish. I, I, you know, if I say that, it's like I'm Debbie Downer. But it's like, wait, this was all over the news. How can you still be eating fish? I don't get it. Well, no, I get it. I get it, really, because you know, people have the concept that it's a very healthy uh, meal. Yeah. You know that it's something that is mm -hmm. extremely vital, and that protein is vital for your. Um, yeah, so and actually sure. all of those uh, organizations that they'll, they'll put the stamp of approval on a fish and, and a type of fish and call it um, sustainable, sustainably harvested, those groups actually, they just, they, they're paid. They're, they're, you know, in order for um, fish to be called sustainable, those, they basically just have to pay these groups. It's greenwashing is what it is. So, no, you're right. You know, I was there too. I, I didn't know. I ate fish for years too. So I, I do get it, but it's just frustrating when, when the information kind of, I just think it just seems, sounds too unbelievable to people. And they're like, well, you're telling me this, but if this was true, then nobody else would be eating it too. And it's a social norm is what it is. That's right, Lori. We, we we're living a bit of a, in a delusional society where... Um, I call it the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Where we think that all of these things are necessary for us, when in reality it's the exact opposite. And Lorelei, why don't you um, tell us to finish off uh, just a little bit about what you eat, you know, because people think, you know, vegans just eat grass and lettuce and <laughs> seeds. So, and, and you know, there's all different ways of being vegan. You can be, you know, very strictly plant-based or, you know, or not, but there's a very delicious and uh, financially feasible, economic ways mm -hmm. of eating vegan, which are very practical and very easy to do, delicious and delicious, and, and even more delicious and convenient. So, why don't you tell us, like, on a given day, what you have for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? <laughs> okay. Um, lately, I've been um, waking up and having a shake that I make out of any kind of plant-based milk, you know, almond milk, soy milk, flax milk. I like flax milk right now. Mm. Um, I add do you make it yourself, powder. or do you no, buy I don't. it? Or how? I buy it, but oh. I have I have made almond milk in the past. Um, mm. It's actually really easy to make, and it tastes uh, a lot fresher than 
the almond milk you buy in the store. Huh. Yeah. So I I add Mm -hmm. a big scoop of peanut butter, some ice, a banana, and some either cocoa or cacao powder, and some chia seeds. And it is so good. It's like having ice cream for breakfast. (laughs) It's totally healthy. Do you soak the chia seeds the night before so that they're easy to blend, or do you just blend them? Um, I don't. I have a uh, Vitamix. Okay. I probably should soak them, though, because from what I understand, it creates a, a natural process happens that it's easier to digest so i should i should start soaking them oh, um i don't know i was just saying because you know a lot of people soak it because it's just easier to blend but if mm-hmm. not you know it should be fine so you have mm-hmm. a smoothie for breakfast it sounds very good you said peanut butter you said chocolate and that one meal that, yeah mm-hmm. that sounds sounds, that delicious. sounds very delicious you know you could it's even really add good. some you know berries and make it uh, more fruity <laughs> some mm-hmm. yeah, sometimes i make a green smoothie with with fruits and vegetables kale and um you know different kinds of yummy fruits mm. you, you don't it's like you taste the greens but mm-hmm. they become just fresh like fruit taste um so yeah. good I, I crave it and that way and that way you don't have to be um chewing for a very long time to eat a huge salad <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know if you're in a hurry okay exactly. so that's um, um that's one breakfast okay yeah and then I'll, maybe like mid-morning maybe i'll have some toast with avocado on it or or peanut butter or a handful of Brazil nuts or an apple or, you know, a piece of fruit. Um, and for lunch, I usually try to have a big salad for lunch with beans. Um, and you and you work, let me just interrupt so that the public knows, and you you work full time, right? Like you, mm-hmm. okay. So, so it's convenient for you. Like you're able to do it even though you have a full time job. Yeah, and... I mean, honestly, the hardest thing about mm-hmm. being vegan is people's reactions to it and people believing that it's hard i spend more time explaining to people where i get my protein than i ever think about getting my protein. oh yeah refer them to our videos or you'll see a great video about protein basics <laughs> really okay, on meet your definitely. future yeah just go meet your future.com you'll see a very good video on protein it's like five minutes we talk about <laughs> how everything has um, amino acids and we talk about that and um, what else was I going to ask you? Reminds me of something that showed up on my social media. It's like a pie chart where the entire pie is red, and so red represents, I think blue represents how much time I spend worrying about getting protein, and blue is nowhere to be found on the pie chart, and then red represents how much time I spend explaining to people oh, where I get my protein. Funny. But I you know that what, that you, should, you, oh, should, yeah. you should delight <laughs> in the fact that people ask you, you know, you should set an example. You're, you know, a beautiful, young lady, entrepreneur, you know. You should um, set an example so that people ask you about what you're doing and use that opportunity to bring up these issues. Yeah, oh, as I'm sure do. you do. I do. I follow up with a, with an email. <laughs> 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 They're probably sorry they ever asked. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, uh, oh, but yeah, you know, uh, going back to the Meet Your Future, we have a very short video on protein basics, which you should look at then when people okay, ask you about protein. Definitely. Check it out. Yeah. And then so we were in lunchtime. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah. You were telling us about um, uh huh. So yeah, I'll, I'll you know if I'll, maybe I'll just bring a, a veggie wrap or mm-hmm. um, like I said a salad or just whatever. There, I get like you can get frozen burritos that are totally vegan that are delicious if you just want to heat something up real quick. Um, so that's lunch, and that's then lunch. again I'll have a little snack in the in the afternoon. Same same thing that I would have in the morning. Just mix it up a bit. Um, and then for dinner, I'm really lucky because my fiance is. An, excellent uh cook oh. so but you know we have sometimes when we don't really feel like you know making a big effort we'll we'll have a, a veggie burger at, like store-bought um mm-hmm. field field roast grain meat it's called oh, oh it's, it's delicious so oh it's so, oh, my so God, good, it's so good the hand-formed burger Oh, I haven't tried those, but field roast. So what's we the name of the Thanks- celebration roast? Oh my yeah, God. we did that for the Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Yeah, they're so delicious. Oh yeah, they're a little we bit have, salty. We got a roast from um, <laughs> Native Foods for Thanksgiving. Oh, nice, nice, nice. It's- so, so, and when your fiance cooks, like, what kind of stuff does he do? <sighs> Let's see. Now I'm looking through his Facebook. Through his Facebook. <laughs> I can remember some of the food. Um, this weekend, he made. Waffles smothered in tempeh bacon with garlic, rosemary, potatoes. Oh, <laughs> oh my wow. goodness. Oh, that sounds so really delicious. Like yeah. He's, uh, we'll make, you know, just different stews. Um, he does, like, 
He'll try. He, oh, he made tofu belly, like in the style of pork belly. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Interesting. <laughs> nice. Tofu belly <laughs> with cool. uh, lemon, garlic, green beans, and uh, slivered almonds, and some more roasted potatoes. So, I, I mean, you know, even if you're not much of a cook, you can just Google for uh, like. There's so many recipes. It is so easy online mm-hmm. and in, in cookbooks, and you can you teach yourself how to make these amazing meals. That's right. And usually the the less time you want to invest, that's what I found. That the, you know, the lazier you get, if you don't want to invest that much time, you can always steam things and do a quick salad and it ends up being a pretty healthy meal. Totally. Anyway, yeah. It looks like we're running out of time, Lorelei. We want to thank you so much for joining us. And we want to invite our viewers, uh, what viewers? <laughs> <laughs> the listeners, to check out your fantastic website, which is www.truthordrought.com. Is that right? Truth. Yeah, truthordrought.com. And we have leaflets and uh, lawn signs that people can print or order Um to spread the word about this. And every, again, everything is sourced completely from rep- reputable sources. So please check it out. Check it out. And then they can check out your Facebook as well because you have a very good Facebook presence. <laughs> yeah. Thank lot, you. I spent good. a lot of time on there. Okay. Great, great infographics. <laughs> great infographics. And, fantastic. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Lorelei. Thank you. Talk to you very soon. Much. Thank you, guys. Take care. You, you too. too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, for... Uh, for joining us for this hour, um, I guess we've got uh, a few more minutes, two but minutes. we're gonna two minutes, <laughs> two is, minutes is what we've been said, sold. Yes. <laughs> so I guess we could um, uh, we could talk about uh, what um, for two minutes. Um, yeah, we don't have. Uh, we really don't have enough time. I was no, gonna go into invite eggs everyone, little, but no, there's not, there's not enough time. Why don't we just invite our viewers to get information to educate? Uh, mm-hmm. viewers, I keep calling you listeners, <laughs> to get information and invite them to follow a vegan diet, which is wonderful for your health. It is wonderful for the environment, for the humanity in general, and for the animals. You know, we didn't grow up this way. We tend to think it's uh, normal to do this, but our actions are actually causing a severe impact on how these animals are bred into existence, how they die, how they're treated. It's a horror show that we really want no part of. So we just want to invite all of you guys to please consider going vegan for all of those reasons. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank and, you. No, and, and with that, it's, it's our show again. It's been, um, I'm Bob Rampfogel and Dr. Sophia Panetta Ochoa. And we do thank you for, for joining us. Um, and stay tuned uh, next week, next Tuesday from 8 to 9 for the, the next show where we'll be celebrating Pride Week uh, as we hear some highlights from the New York City Veggie Pride Parade. And coming and, up next, And Geraldine is going to be hosting that. Geraldine will be hosting. She's going to be hosting. And um, the show that's... Um, Coming up, coming okay, up next. he's telling me to pronounce it because it's, it's in, in Spanish, Spanish. Okay. and I will butcher it. <laughs> <laughs> the next show is called Proyect- Proyecto Latinoamericano, so stay tuned for that. Thank you so much. Thank you Good very night. much.